mandatory is poison. It's a bold statement. Let's see if I can back it up. I'm Mike Dushman, and I run uh, this YouTube channel, Stateless Code. It's mostly about just I make coding videos, uh, teach people how to how to code, and I branch out every so often and do some other things. I have a series called Why Stateless Code, where I kind of go and riff on the idea of Start With Why by Simon Sinek. We'll get back to him later in this talk. Uh, and then I occasionally will just have a, I have a playlist called Stateless Opinion, and this is going to be one of those here. So uh, this is a, maybe a bold and shocking statement to somebody, uh, to some people. Uh, I'm going to see if I can first clarify the nature of mandatory, kind of say what mandatory is, and then we'll talk through some of the implications of this. So mandatory is the idea, conform or else, comply or else. Uh, it, it's, I think we've seen almost a, a hyper uh, acceleration of this, especially since um, the COVID uh, and the pandemics and everything hit. Uh, and what are the impacts of that? So when I say mandatory is poison, um, th there are times when real life things are poison. Chemotherapy is poison. Uh, but sometimes the, the cost benefit of the risk reward, I'm going to um, take something that is poison and use it as a medicine because the alternative, the cancer uh, of it is, uh, is worse. I, I foresee the likely scenario of uh, leaving the cancer untreated to be worse than treating it. And, and Let's be honest, it doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes the, uh, the chemo kills you faster than the cancer does. Uh, it, it's subjective as all things medical are. Um, but you can have situations where like you, even then you don't give chemotherapy to people who are well and healthy. Uh, that's just poisoning people. Uh, so the, whenever you enforce something, you are taking away from people the decision that they would make if left to themselves. And there is a danger in that, that it's dehumanizing to that person. You're treating that person like a child. Uh, and, and again, sometimes like it, child starts running toward the busy street, <laughs> having a mandatory there is, is worthwhile. I mean, you grab the child and <laughs> keep, prevent them from running into the street and um, putting the child's life at risk. Uh, but when you get into situations where you've got grown people and you want to uh, give them a comply or else directive about where they're supposed to work and when, uh, locking people down in their houses and putting curfews about when they can go out, uh, medical decisions of all kinds, um, even things like if you're in a business, like your, your decision to make a, a mass layoff versus another uh, business decision um, in terms of your bottom line, th those things all have, uh, or, or the, um, the HR mandate, like we are going to do this and you will comply or you can find a job somewhere else, you hope. Uh, all those things are taking away from people the, 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 the decisions that they would make if they were allowed to make them for themselves. And there is always a cost there. Um, it can be a cultural cost. It can be just that dehumanizing, like I'm, yeah, I'm being forced to, I live two hours away from the office and I'm being forced to come in right now. And they say, yeah, you can find another job. But like the people in the C-suite making those decisions have, it's been a long time since any of them had to worry about making basic ends meet the next month. So, um, and, and the, the, the larger, the, the scope of these top down decisions, the greater, often the oppression that is associated with them. 
Uh, and it, again, it's not just business. It's not just politics. Um, you can have spiritual tyranny um, or social tyranny where you kind of shun the person who doesn't conform. You go and uh, just put all of these, like this endless list of do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts. Um, and that affects the culture of your organization uh, or, of your, or of your community. So this is something that sh you should tread carefully. Even if you are doing this and you, you kind of say you're in the, uh, the, the situation where you think you've got a cancer and you need a chemotherapy level of mandatory, you need to be careful. Uh, there's an idea also of in, at least back when medical profession professionals were uh, ethical and did their jobs, the idea of first do no harm. Uh, and there's also the idea of iatrogenics, harm done by the healer. If you want to ruin your health really fast, the best way to do that is to get a personal doctor. Uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb in his book Antifragile and maybe some of his other ones kind of uh, brings out that point. Like it, the, the, the idea I'm in a position of rule or authority or um, I'm being told that I'm responsible for something. The idea is that you've got to do something and very often that leads to a bias of intervention. Um, and when you, you do that, you, you wind up um, the further away and the larger the scale of these organizations, the farther you get away from the people who actually have the knowledge about these things. So if you think about the, the top-down modernist 20th century Soviet five-year plan thing, like I'm, we have this uh, grand plan of how these things are going to work and, um, and then like... The people on the ground know that this isn't going to work and they know that people are going to starve to death if this decision is enforced, it gets enforced, actual people star starve to death. Um, the results of mandatory aren't obviously always that uh, dire, but you, you need to be careful about these things. Uh, every time you... Uh, micromanage somebody or have that uh, do this or else, the action required, the um, all of those other things, um, you're, for one, showing that you don't trust the people in your organization to do the right thing. Uh, so Simon Sinek, in a recent video I saw a couple days ago on LinkedIn, talked about how bad leaders will kind of demand trust and like... Um, from their people, whereas the the good leaders will um, have the idea, I'm going to trust you and earn trust back. Uh, and you can't, you, you don't earn trust, you alienate trust, you undermine trust when you have the do this or else mandatory um, outlook on things. Um, and you can see the, the the decisions whenever possible, and again, this is an opinion piece, uh, should be made at the level closest to the bottom, if you're thinking like top down versus bottom up. The people on the front lines have the best information about the particulars of the decision that they are going to make. The uh, going back to our corporate idea, the C-suite people have no idea what your fr frontline people in, you've got hundred, maybe hundreds of departments in your company and you don't know on a given day what those frontline people are, are facing. And even if you go and try to um, do multiple skip level type things to go down to that um, undercover boss level of something, you've got an experience with some people for a week. And then by the time uh, the, 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 that will have changed and become outdated uh, by the time that the, the next quarter comes around. Um, so uh, the, there's that temptation to always want to intervene, especially 
the, the idea, both political, organizationally, we've got to do something. Uh, but there are situations where uh, not doing anything has turned out to be shown to be the better situation. Uh, we've got the recent situation with COVID where uh, you can weasel all of the statistics you want, but the one that the, the actuaries are going to hold you accountable to is deaths above expected. So all in deaths, like you, people can kind of misattribute causes of deaths and all this other stuff. But the country that did the least amount of intervention, Sweden, uh, is the one that had the lowest increase in total deaths above expected, above among all countries. And that, I back in February 2020, I could have told you that that would have been the case. Um, and even if you, you take something like COVID and you kind of, instead of straw manning it, you steel man it and make it, all right, this is 95% fatality rate. It's as, it's uh, more contagious than the common cold and all this stuff going on. It's like, you, you can't govern your way out of a situation like that. You can't mandate your way out of a situation like that. And in that situation, like the, the, if, you, if you try to put up restrictions and all that stuff, uh, what will happen is the people who are going to risk their lives to try to provide things like food to you won't be able to do it. And um, even the the five the ninety five percent of the people will get killed by the disease, and the other five percent will starve. Uh, so those situations like that, it becomes even more important to let people make their own decisions, make their own cost benefit analyses analyses. Uh, and it, it's kind of that idea, using economics as an example of the the John Maynard Keynes econometrics, we can plan the economy, um, even though you've got 7 billion people in this world, each with their own um, particular values and all that, that we, we can uh, top down this and make the right decisions on their behalf. That is hubris. Uh, on the other hand, you've got kind of the Austrian stream of economics with Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, who say, no, you've got each person has individual subjective values and they're, they're not themselves quantifiable. So you've got a kind of an ordered list of th these are my values. And uh, people make decisions and prices emerge and all that stuff on the margins of where those people making their actual um, decisions of what I value versus this versus that. Um, th those that's how these things work, and it winds up um, you wind up getting in a an unmanaged and spontaneous scenario a better result than you could ever from the the, the person even if you put the smartest people in charge of quote unquote running the economy, you will have disasters and shortages and all these other things because um, they know less than the people who are actually making decisions for themselves about what they need. Uh, and there, there is an interesting, again, like Sweden is the, the counter example for COVID intervention. Hong Kong, is, at least in the 20th century, is the the counter example for economic intervention. So after World War II, uh, and I learned about this from uh, a book, Eat the Rich by P.J. O'Rourke, uh, there was uh, a, an administrator, a British administrator, John James Cowperthwaite, who was sent to Hong Kong to try to uh, rebuild it and have the, uh, it, for, help them kind of rebuild post-war and uh, see to their economic well-being. And he, kind of unique among all 20th century politicians, decided to um, enact a policy of kind of proactive non-intervention. And Hong Kong went from being one of the poorest countries in the world to becoming one of the richest countries in the world. Um, and it was largely just because he had the courage to not intervene. 
to not make everything mandatory. He even, it's funny, ironically, the one thing he did mandate uh, was he banned the collection of economic statistics. So the um, kind of knowing the temptations of bureaucrats and technocrats to want to intervene if they have stats in front of them, I'm going to make my, uh, how many times have you heard in politics, business, data-driven decisions or whatever, um, that he, he, he knew that, that that's a temptation for people. And so he said, nope, we're not even going to track economic statistics. Um, and again, the, the, it's the one, almost the one time where non-intervention has been tried and it's um, got some, uh, it, it had amazing benefits. Uh, so the application of this, if you're a business, great or small, if you're a family, a uh, parent, um, if you're a, a religious leader, an organization, community leader, um, the just be cautious and mindful of the cost of when you mandate something. Um, you're taking choices away from people and you're showing that you don't trust them. Uh, let the people kind of give the freedom people the freedom to make their their own decisions, reap the benefits of it, kind of own the outcome of those decisions. Uh, but if you try to even if you've got a good idea, you don't need to force people to, to adopt it. Like the, the idea of got to versus get to. If you've got the great idea, just remove the, 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 the roadblocks from people adopting it. Um, people will voluntarily adopt a good idea if they believe it's good for them. Uh, but if you, like, this is my great idea, adopt it or else, I know the one best way of doing all things, you're going to harm your culture. Again, all types of organizations down to the, to the family uh, you're going to harm your culture if you go with the uh, kind of the the stick rather than the carrot as your basis for doing these things. Um, so that's in general what I'm advocating here. Uh, I'm also going to bring up some objections. So the first one is, won't there be chaos? Uh, the answer is maybe. Uh, but I get, are you, the, the trade-off versus if you have, let me, for the sake of argument, say, yeah, you'll have more chaos if you go this way. Um, the, the trade-off is, do you want a, a culture, like a vibrant culture of bottom up, um, churn where people are, um, encouraged to have ideas and even if like make mistakes uh, in, in the chaos or one where you've got compliant worker drones. Um, you, which one do you want? Um, my, me personally, I want to be in the one where there's a little bit more chaos. It's a little bit messier. Um, people are making mistakes. Um, and this is um, one of those things that, again, you, you earn trust by extending trust. So um, that there there may be, let's say you've got, if you don't direct everything, you've got two parallel things that go on and they, they both come up with the same idea and you've got duplication of effort. Well, you at the end of the day, you've both still learned something. There's probably, they probably didn't implement it exactly the same way and you can take the best of, um, of both, throw away what doesn't work and then um, you, you, you've, you've still both um, kind of learn from it. Um, the other um, another objection, objection is what about actual bad actors? So yeah, I, I, I get the idea of um, the, uh, the dangers of mandatory, but like everybody's a bad actor, like the, the, uh, the caricature, uh, 
Calvinist of um, total depravity, like only evil continually. Um, if I don't mandate everything down to like micromanaging the the rice on your plate when you're eating lunch, um, you're going to just wreck the world. Uh, and the problem with that is that you've got if if you've got humans on kind of the 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 receiving end of those commands, you also have bad actors on the giving ends of those commands. Uh, and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien has this quote, and it's one of my favorite ones, the most improper, and I'm doing this from memory, so it might not be completely accurate, the most improper activity for a man is bossing other men. Not one in a million is qualified to do it, least of all those who seek the opportunity. Um, if the history of politics has taught us anything, it's that the, um, the, the worst in humanity is attracted to political power, not the best, um, and will seek to um, consolidate it and use it against other people. Um, as you can, as you might note from my logo, uh, I'm, I'm a political anarchist. I, I don't think that it's uh, proper or right for a, uh, for one human being to rule over another. Um, and I think that the, the danger, like the, 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 just like this, the, the poison is like the, the cure is worth worse than the disease, um, on this. Uh, one more thing that you might note is, and this will be my final objection, uh, logistics might take a temporary hit. So, uh, I, I will readily admit that I am bad at logistics, that um, all of my, my gifts are in um, ideation, creativity, um, and I've kind of gotten better at relationship building, but logistics is just universally my, uh, my worst suit. Um, and so people who are good at logistics typically are more kind of craving standards in the best way of doing all these things. And even then, your logistics might take a temporary hit when you go from um, command and control to kind of trust and freedom. Uh, but in, in those situations where um, you think that the... Um, where this would work the least is actually work the best. The idea, like an assembly line... Uh, Toyota had the idea, like anybody is empowered to pull the lever and stop the assembly line if something is going wrong. That uh, when you empower people to do the right thing, um, even if you get a little less conformity and standards and all those things, um, it will build a culture of ownership. Uh, and you can see that even in organizations and departments and stuff like that, that are not, uh, th that are operational and logistical in nature. Uh, I had one great example from a leader in my past where this was in an operations department where one of the um, kind of the people who reported to him had an initiative that failed. And rather than the like, the mandate, like, um, you didn't conform, um, here, here's the, the punishment uh, mentality. What he did was he sent an email, like copied his entire department and said, you know what, um, you won't always hit a home run, but I'm glad that you took the swing and that it's, I, I'd much rather see you swing for the fences and miss than to kind of be afraid to make a mistake. And uh, what happened in the wake of that was that, again, this is an operations department. Uh, we kicked off an innovation committee and we implemented, um, I think, 100 ideas in like a year um, that this, uh, it's okay to make mistakes. It's, we want kind of to invite this, this bottom up, uh, even from people who are good at logistics, like it encourage this whole swell of bottom-up 
uh, innovation and uh, trust and um, the uh, kind of motivation to I I know that if I try to make things better, I will get support for doing that, uh, and that's really what leaders need to be doing. It's um, not about making up like deciding what is best for every last person in your com company. Um, that that's a, a a dangerous way to go. It's how do I protect um, the, the culture? How do I not screw it up? Um, and kind of how do I trust people to earn back that trust so that when in those rare occasions, when, when decisions need to be made about I'm going to prioritize this project and not that project, uh, you, you've earned that trust that um, th this person is shown that they are going to continue giving us the freedom and that they'll that they're um, they're aligned with our North Star and they'll do the right thing. So uh, some food for thought. Uh, feel free to uh, comment and discuss. And um, I'm certainly not always right about everything and I'm open to um, counterpoints and all, all that stuff. But I figured I'd just um, kind of throw this metaphorical um, Um, I guess, metaphorical grenade uh, out there and see what happens. So see you in the next video. Ruby on Rails 7 is out. Code along on a guided journey through the Rails 7 Getting Started Guide and beyond with test-driven development. There has never been a better time to learn Ruby on Rails. Hit the ground running with the newest version. Go to statelesscode.com slash getting started with Rails 7 to level up. Thanks for watching this Stateless Code video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and spread the word. Check out our growing library of videos on our social media channels. Follow us at Stateless Code, and taxation is theft.